Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Stacy Catron, and I have the privilege of serving as the director of the Cherokee Garden Library for the Atlanta History Center. I am delighted you could join us virtually this evening. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the library, it was founded by the Cherokee Garden Club of Atlanta in 1975 and is named for the state floral emblem of Georgia, the Cherokee Rose, which of course is today an invasive plant in our state. The Cherokee Garden Library is one of the special collection libraries of the Keenan Research Center here at the Atlanta History Center. The library collects and preserves works in gardening, landscape design, garden history, horticulture, floral design, botanical art, plant ecology, natural landscapes, and cultural landscapes. Ranging in date from 1586 to the present, the library's books, periodicals, manuscript collections, and visual arts collections tell the stories of horticulture and botanical history in the southeastern United States and areas of influence throughout the world. The library has a symbiotic relationship with the Atlanta History Center's Gazueta Gardens, a remarkable 33-acre green space that holds nine distinct ecologically beneficial and educational gardens. I invite you to learn more about these treasures of the Atlanta History Center via our website and in person with appropriate protocols in place, of course, to keep us all safe. I had the honor of introducing Dr. Talamy when he was our keynote speaker here in October of 2016. And it is my great pleasure to introduce him again this evening. Doug Talamy is a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has taught insect related courses for 40 years. It will come as no surprise that he has won many awards and is extremely in demand, giving virtual talks to groups almost every single day throughout the year virtually since the pandemic started last March. His award-winning book, Bringing Nature Home, How Native Plants Sustain Wildlife in Our Gardens, was first published by Timber Press in 2007. This book, changed how tens of thousands of Americans view their plants and their yards. I was among those who were deeply changed by his book. This quiet yet powerful revolution is occurring all over our country due to the awareness that our small ecosystems are vital to insects and wildlife. Talmy taught us to plant more native plants and to bring more beneficial insects to our yards fostering more bi biodiversity. This evening, Dr. Talamy will discuss his newest book, Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard. And now just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Please add your questions in the Q&A box throughout the talk, and I will share your questions with Dr. Talamy following his talk in about 60 minutes time. Welcome, Dr. Talamy, and thank you for sharing your important mission with our virtual audience this evening. Thank you very much, Stacey. Um, and thanks for coming tonight. I have to tell you, I'm trying something new. I usually have a cup of coffee before my talks, but tonight I had a cup of decaf. I hope that wasn't a big mistake. If I fall asleep in the middle, that, that's why. Um, well, before I fall asleep, let's talk about nature's best hope, or at least my idea of what nature's best hope is. But before I do that, I want to return to what happened a year ago, not this fall, but a year ago in the fall, there was what we call an oak mast. All the, the oaks in the red oak group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time from Massachusetts all the way down to, to Georgia. Uh, and this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it and I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First it chewed a little hole and then forced its head through. And of course the rest of its body through that little hole kind of, it was a tight squeeze, looked like a Pillsbury Doughboy. Then it plopped down. This is a very dangerous time for this, this larva because it's really good to eat. Lots of things want to eat it. So it has, has to get to safety by squirming and wiggling underground 
and it does that in about 30 seconds where it stretches in all directions and makes a chamber. And inside that chamber, it converts to a pupa and then it stays there for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. This is what an acorn weevil looks like. It looks like it has a very long nose. That's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down here. And they take those mouth parts and chew a hole down into the center of the acorn. And that is how the, the larva gets into the center. Um, well, you might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the very next year? Uh, and that's a good question, but it takes red oak cake acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be nearly enough acorns for them. Of course, once they're out, that leaves a, a hole in the acorn, a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. In this case, she has filled it with three uh, species of temnothorax ants, little teeny ants that love to make their homes inside the holes vacated by acorn weevils in acorns. And if they find a brand new acorn, their old acorns falling apart. So they want to move the, the old colony in and they all get excited. They tell everybody and that's what they do right away. They grab the larvae and the eggs and the queen and they all work hard. About 30 minutes, they have completed the move into the new acorn. Then they post a, a guard right here at the edge, make sure nobody else comes in and they'll stay in this new acorn until it falls apart in about two years time. Well, about this time, my wife says, what's your point? What are you trying to tell us? I'm trying to tell you that that is just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions that comprise most of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and oaks. Um, jays are the primary disperser of oak, oak acorns. They can fly up to two miles from the parent tree. They tap it beneath the ground. And a lot of times they forget where they did that and that plants a new new oak tree. Um, recently, this, this fall found out what is actually pollinating our, our witch hazels. You can read that it's it's uh, cyarid gnats and little flies, but when you look at the flowers, you never see any gnats or flies. Um, it's actually a, a, a series of moths called winter moths. Um, this bicolored sallow is just one of the species of winter moths and they fly very late. I actually caught a bicolored sallow on Christmas Eve this year. There was snow on the ground. Uh, and of course, witch hazels bloom very late. Uh, so I don't know whether the winter moths are flying late because of witch hazel or whether witch hazel is, is blooming late because of winter moths, but at this point they're both taking advantage of each other. You won't have pileated woodpeckers breeding anywhere near you if you don't have a lot of carpenter ants because that is what they rear their young on, and you won't have carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have this plant, Facilia. It is the only that's the only pollen that that species will rear its young on. And as a matter of fact, pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We've got about 4,000 species of native bees and about 1,300 of them are highly specialized on the pollen of particular plant genera. Uh, so around here, it's about 13 species of bees on the genera of, or on the pollen of um, um, perennial sunflowers. Baltimore checker spots need white turtle head. I could go on all night long talking about uh, very specialized relationships, but today these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was gonna mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, stood on the edge, looked out over the, the magnificent view, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the creation of the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, of course, that's not an option anymore today. Leaving the country as it was, um, we simply can't do that. And that's because there's only about 5% of the lower 48 states that's anything close to its original uh, ecological condition. We have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We have grazed it. We've got 770 million uh, acres of rangeland, which is four and a half times the size of Texas. And of course, we paved it or otherwise developed it. We've straightened our rivers and dammed them, and you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We have drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up the natural world into tiny remnants of its former self, and each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. Why have we done that? Well, of course, we thought the earth was, was so huge, our nest was so huge that we could, we could follow it forever and there'd be no consequences, but we were wrong. And that's why we're seeing headlines like this, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Talking about global insect decline. 
followed by this one. North America has lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American bird population. Now the UN says uh, the strong likelihood that we will lose a million species to extinction, possibly in the next 20 years. And I love the way they report this as if it's just another headline. They might as well say we're gonna lose oxygen in the next 20 years because this is not an option, folks. Losing a million species is not an option. Well, I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, thus upon all of our houses. But that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take a small effort from a lot of people, but those, those small efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return to this headline briefly. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, E.O. Wilson, Harvard Emeritus, you know, one of the, probably the most famous biologists alive today, told us what it would mean if we lost insects. And he did it way back in 1987 in this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. His message was very, very simple. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, it would not only change the physical structure of our terrestrial habitats, but it would almost end energy flow through those habitats, which would cause the collapse of the food webs that support our animals. The amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, even our freshwater fish would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and we'd only have bacteria and, and fungi to do that job. And of course, humans would not survive any of those drastic changes. Good news is uh, that doesn't have to happen. We can save our, our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're gonna have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on nature, dependent on, on what we call ecosystem services produced by productive, happy ecosystems. These are just a few things that, that um, plants give us, for example. When I say give us, they, they provide it for all the species on the planet, not just us. Oxygen, pretty important. Clean our water, slow its journey to the sea where it's too salty to use. Here's an enormously important one, uh, capturing carbon, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere you know, carbons take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere every day. Uh, and through photosynthesis, they convert it to, to energy. They put that carbon in their tissues and the extra carbon they pump into the ground uh, through their root systems. That's why the soil is brown or black. It's because of carbon that, that uh, plant roots have put there. So a major way of fighting climate change is to plant plants. Plants build topsoil, they hold it in place, pretty important. They prevent floods, they dampen severe weather and many other things. What do animals do for plants? Well, they provide pest control services for those plants. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds and other things. So developing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is simply not an option. Never was a good option. Uh, but today with 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet, it's a terrible option. There were visionaries through the ages that have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Now, some of our indigenous groups have been good at doing that, but um, by and large, our, our huge Western societies and huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer in any one place, completely spoil it, move to another place, do the same thing over and over. Aldo recognized that is not a sustainable way to treat the earth. So he had a dream that we would actually develop what he called a land ethic. And he wrote about this in the Sand County Almanac. In his dream, he, we, would, we would use the earth like we have to. We'd farm it and lumber it and graze and, and hunt and mine. But we would learn to do it gently without destroying local ecosystems. That was his land ethic. What has always surprised me is that he never wrote about developing a land ethic where we actually lived. Uh, and I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that, that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time, that notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, still embedded in our own culture today, that he may not have recognized it as an option. Well, tonight I wanna, I wanna not only say that living with nature not just is an option, it's, I'm gonna argue it's the only viable option that is left to us now. You know, in the past conservationists worked pretty 
pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We need to turn that on its head and now we need to, to save nature, reconstruct it because we've dismantled it in so many places where there are a lot of people because that's most of the earth. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not just exist, but thrive. Where are we going to start? Well, let's go back to private property. Uh, we cannot ignore private property because so much of the land is privately owned. 85.6% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi privately owned. If we ignored private property in our conservation efforts, we would fail because that would leave us dealing on, on just areas that are too small and too isolated to actually sustain the species that we need them to sustain. But there are lots of places that we haven't considered uh, as, as viable options for conservation. How about power and pipeline rights of ways? We got 21 million acres in power and pipeline rights of ways. Three, 300,000 kilometers of pipelines or of, of power lines just in this country. Railroad rights of ways, we got 3 million acres. Roadside, 17 million acres. Golf courses, 2 million acres. Airports, 3 million acres. The Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are huge places. Then we have all of the places where we live from rural areas to suburbia to cities, hundreds of millions of acres in those areas. So if you add up just these and you can think of others, that's 599 million acres. It could be used for conservation that right now really isn't. How big is 599 million acres? It's big. It's bigger than Vermont plus New Jersey plus Maine, Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana, California, and Texas all added up. So not having a place to do conservation is not the issue. We can do conservation in lots of places. I want to talk about conservation, um, not really using the word correctly. Uh, I'm talking about rebuilding nature where we already haven't done conservation. We've dismantled it. Uh, but all species don't contribute equally to, uh, to ecosystem function. So we have to start with the building blocks, the species that are most important, the species that other species depend on. Uh, and, and the first thing we have to think about are the two groups of, of animals that are absolutely vital. And that would be pollinators because they're gonna keep all those flowering plants around. Without the pollinators, we lose the flowering plants. But then we need to take the energy that those flowering plants capture from the sun and turn into food and get it to other animals. Most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants. That something is typically insects and it's most often caterpillars. Caterpillars transfer more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So we need to construct ecosystems that are loaded with caterpillars to get the energy out of the plants so that we have other species in our ecosystems. Let me use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Uh, now, many of you have heard me speak about chickadees in the past because we have a lot of data on chickadees, uh, but they're great examples of, of insectivores. Even though chickadees are at your feeders right now eating seeds, about 50% of their diet in the wintertime is seeds. When they reproduce, really important time in their life history, their babies can't eat seeds. So they switch to insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will feed their young exclusively on insects. And chickadees are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds are rearing their young on insects. And most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? Well, there's lots of lines of evidence that suggest that, but this is a citizen science project that one of my grad students recently finished. Ashley Kennedy put out a call for bird photographers all over the country to take pictures of birds during the breeding season, uh, carrying food back to the nest, and then send the pictures to Ashley. And what she did was identify the prey items that were in the beaks of those birds. And the idea was to reconstruct the nestling diet based on what the birds are bringing back to the, to the nest for 20 of the common bird families in North America. She got thousands of pictures and was able to do that. The green bars are the percentage of each one of those, those bird families, percentage of the nestling diet that is caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So imagine what would happen if we took caterpillars out of the system. Most of our birds would not be able to reproduce. What's special about caterpillars? Something, actually several things. One is that they are, they're relatively soft prey items. Think of this guy as if it's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is exoskeleton, it's cuticle. Uh, and birds don't want a lot of cuticle, it's undigestible. Um, so caterpillars are perfect. And because they're soft, you can stuff them down the throat of your offspring without fear of, of injuring them. Uh, and if you ever watch a parent bird rear its young, they're, they're pretty rough. Their beak is like a plunger, they just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. 
Now, some of our, our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but uh, do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein, low percentage of chitin compared to many other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. A lot of exoskeleton, a lot of undigestible parts, and a lot of beetles have, have uh, many sharp edges. And it turns out the caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids um, not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates. And we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. We have to get them from plants. Only plants make carotenoids. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of our diets. And that's why my wife, Cindy, makes sure that I have lots of carrots to eat to get my beta carotene and lots of tomatoes. Actually, I had tomatoes tonight to get my lycopene, lots of whatever that is to get my lutein. Uh, and, and when she succeeds in getting to me to eat those things, it stimulates my immune system. And I can't think of a better time to have a very strong immune system. Carotenoids are also antioxidants. They run around our body, protect our, our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about things like this male prothonotary warbler who is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutines. And he takes those lutines, makes pigments out of them, puts them in his feathers. And the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. So where are they getting their carotenoids? From the prey that they bring back to the nest. But carotenoids are not equally distributed among invertebrate prey items. These first two bars are types of caterpillars, far more carotenoids than any other type of, of uh, insects. The, th the third bar here are orthopteroids, things like crickets, grasshoppers, and katydids. Um, here are the adult grasshoppers. I mean, the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and the butterflies themselves. They have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm way over here. The early bird gets the, the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. Does carotenoid content, content influence prey choice when birds are breeding? Uh, well, Ashley did another study that suggests, yes, it, it just might. With bluebirds, she put GoPro cameras on the rooftops of bluebird houses, and those cameras took a picture once every second. And the idea was to get a picture of the birds as they were flying into the nest with their prey items. Uh, and she had a lot of GoPro cameras and a lot of bluebird boxes and she did it for three years. So she had over a million pictures to go through. But out of that million pictures, she got 7,628 where they were good enough to identify what the prey item was. And she got this nice relationship. The caterpillars were brought back more than anything else and they had the highest levels of carotenoids followed by orthopteroids, which had the next highest level. And then we got everybody else nestled down here. So it really does suggest that carotenoid might be one of the uh, traits that, that birds are looking for when they're hunting for food for their babies. And if that's true and all the other things that are good about caterpillars, it seems that caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. They may very well be essential parts of bird diets. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. The next question is, how many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two enough? Well, let's ask the question for chickadees again. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. It takes 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one, to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest. Uh, and then they're flying all around. Um, for 21 days, the parents continue to, to feed them caterpillars. So uh, it's many more than six to 9,000. Uh, and, and if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, you have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because the birds are not, not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot to hunt for, for food. They're hunting about 50 meters from the nest. And if you landscape in a way that does not have all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really starting to look like that's directly tied to bird decline. We went to the original data set that uh, from Rosenberg et al, the group that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided terrestrial birds up into the ones that require insects at some part of their life history, typically when they're breeding, and the ones that don't. So things like doves and finches can actually reproduce on seeds. They gained some numbers, but the birds that require insects that depend on them lost on average 10 million individuals per species over the last 50 years. This does not prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that when you take insects away, the birds that need those insects are gonna suffer. So if we care about birds, we need to start landscaping uh, 
for in ways that preserve caterpillars, ways that actually create them, which is totally different from the way we've landscaped in the past. In the past, we wanted every insect on our property to be, to be dead. We're good at that, but we're gonna, we're gonna stop doing that. We're gonna now landscape uh, in a way that creates caterpillars. How do we do that? By putting the plants that support them in our yards. There is a catch though. And that is most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars, which means we have to be very careful about which plants we pick for our yards. Why can't we just pick any old plant? Because, because caterpillars are really fussy about what they eat. Most insects that eat plants are really fussy about what they eat, just like Mr. Monarch Butterfly here. Uh, you can have all the crepe myrtles and camellias and boxwoods and burning bushes and calorie pears that you, you want in your yard. And it's not going to make a single monarch because the only thing they eat is milkweeds. As I said, most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists, just like the monarch. Why? Because plants have made them that way. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they have loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. There's a reason that it's hard to get our kids to eat their vegetables. They inherently know that they're toxic. That's my little joke. This is not a joke. Insects do eat plants. So how do they do it? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. Every plant lineage just protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. Insects can't adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two plant lineages that are very similar and they develop specialized adaptations. They develop enzymes that can store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that allow them to minimize their exposure to those compounds. But it takes a long time for them to develop those, those adaptations. It doesn't happen overnight, which is why when we bring plants in from other countries, our insects can't eat them. They haven't been here nearly long enough for our insects to adapt them. And some of them have been here hundreds of years. It's not nearly long enough. You're talking about many thousands of years for that type of adaptation to happen. All I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to rebuild the food webs that support the life around us, we have to pick the plants that do that because all of them don't. And I'm going to give you three examples of how well this works when we do pick the right plants. I'm going to start with our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is where Cindy and I live. I'm sitting in that window right now. Uh, this was a farm that was broken up uh, into uh, 10 acre lots. We have 10 acres. Um, it, the last thing they did in this farm before we, we uh, bought the piece was mow it for hay. I mean, this is an old farm. It had been, it'd been farmed for over 300 years. And we've got a lot of invasive plants around here, multiflora rose, oriental bittersweet, autumn olive, Japanese honeysuckle. That's what they're mowing for hay. So when they stopped mowing, that's what came back. Uh, just a giant tangle of, of Asian plants uh, on the 10 acres. So after we moved in, that's the first thing we had to do was clear it. Uh, when I say we, I really mean Cindy. She did most of the work. So if you have a serious problem from invasive plants, um, don't give up. You, you can do it. Cindy did it. I know because I watched her. What was I doing? I was, I was congratulating her, telling her she was doing a great job. But I also was putting the plants back. Uh, and I did it selfishly because my little hobby is to take a picture of caterpillars I've never seen before. And this was one. I wanted to see if I could attract Canadian outlets to our property. Well, Canadian outlets... That's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. Have a very specialized diet. They only eat meadow rue. Meadow rue used to grow around here, but not here anymore. It's been gone for hundreds of years. Uh, but I got some meadow rue seeds from someplace else, planted them, grew very nicely. And this was a test. How long, if ever, would it take Canadian outlets to find my meadow rue? Uh, maybe they had to come from Canada. I don't know. So I planted them, but I didn't go out and check them. I really thought it was, we we're going to talk about years here. Finally, after a month and a half, I walked by the meadow rue was doing really well, except it was being defoliated by Canadian outlets. They had found it right away. And now we've got a thriving population of meadow rue and Canadian outlets. So there we go. They've added two species to the property by adding one plant. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. Uh, this is a misnomer. This beautiful yellow moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It is a specialist on Biden's aristosa. 
ditch daisy. I did know where there was some Biden's Aristosa nearby, about 14 miles away in a power line cut. Uh, got some seeds, planted them. They grew really well. Well, it did take a year for, for that moth to find our, our Bidens, but um, now we got four species. Good population of both. I wanted Hackberry Emperor because it's a butterfly that ought to be here. But as its name suggests, Hackberry Emperor needs Hackberry and we didn't have any. So I planted Hackberry. Um, this took four, three, four years for the butterflies to find it, but uh, they did. Now we've got good populations. I walked by one of my Hackberry branches this June and there were nine Hackberry Emperor butterflies, butterfly caterpillars on a single branch. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own, and along with it came many of the things that specialize on goldenrod, like the brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is one that has not come yet, the goldenrod flower moth, and it's beautiful larvae. I don't know why. It should be here, but it's not here yet. So this is anticipation. This is like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I go out and check, check my goldenrod for the goldenrod flower moth. One of these years I'm going to find it and that'll be a great day. Planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. It's a beautiful plant. It'll, it'll climb up your trees without pulling them down. It's very gentle about it. And it's a major uh, host plant for our, our um, very large sphinx moss, things like the Pandora sphinx, which is beautiful itself. And it's uh, equally beautiful adult. The lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx are all on Virginia creeper and many other things are as well. One of the zebra swallowtail. Now I was stretching it here because we are north of the northernmost population of zebra swallowtails that anybody knows about. It's about 26 miles south of us. Uh, well, zebra swallowtails are specialists on pawpaw. So we planted pawpaw and then we waited. We waited nine years, uh, but after nine years, the zebra swallowtails did come. And now we've got a population of them. In the meantime, we got the, the pawpaw sphinx. I didn't know there was a pawpaw sphinx. And of course, lots of pawpaws. One of the double tooth prominent because it's just such an interesting looking caterpillar. Well, it is a specialist on elm. So we planted American elm. We got the caterpillar right away. Wanted evening primrose moth because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. So we planted an evening primrose. The moths came, they, they uh, spend the day with their head stuck in the flower. And then I planted lots of oaks. Now, these are just examples of the plants we put in our yard, but I wanna focus on oaks for, for a few minutes because they're such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. It is hundreds of years old. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. Um, it's enormous. And a lot of people think that your oak has to be enormous before uh, it will contribute to, to your, your ecosystem. Not so. And I can say that with confidence because I planted my oaks as uh, acorns or two foot bare root whips. So they were free or they cost $1.50. So, you know, I hear all the time, not gonna plant an oak, I won't live long enough to enjoy it. If you live one more year, you can enjoy it because right away my oaks, as tiny as they were, started to bring in the things that run the food webs on my property. Like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, the orange headed epicolema, the red washed caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tusted tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two-spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panapoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more moth species have come to the oaks on my property, including the Bernie meme caterpillar. Got him just the other day. He does well in the cold, by the way. And they come right away. This is a pin oak that's just popped its head above the leaves. And here's a crocus geometer standing on the ground eating that, that pin oak. So you don't have to wait hundreds of years for your oaks to contribute. They contribute immediately. This is a picture taken from the same place I took that first picture. I'm still sitting in this window up here. Just wanna show you, we've got lawn, we're very traditional, but we put, put plants back. I'm still adding plants to the property. Who knows how diverse it was before it was, was farmed. But every time I add a plant lineage to the property, I get new species of, of moths. And since moths drive the food web, uh, I wanted, it was a little hobby to take a picture of every species of moth on my property. I'm still doing it. I started four years ago and I am up to 1,031 species of moths recorded right here so far. Haven't gotten to the butterflies yet, I will. That's 1,031 species of moths on 10 acres. Now, Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. 
So on one 240,000th of the land area, we have 40% of all the moths that are found in the entire state. And because each one of these is a type of bird food, we have recorded 59 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres terrestrial birds, which is 38% of all the terrestrial birds that breed in the entire state of Pennsylvania. Saw this, this headline this past fall, World Wildlife Fund says two thirds of the wildlife on planet Earth have vanished since 1970. But I'm thinking not at our house. We put the plants back and I swear we have increased biodiversity by at least two thirds and it didn't take that long to do it. It was very simple. So I'm offering this um, as, as a word of encouragement, these are terrible, frightening headlines, but we can turn them around if we simply change the way we treat the land. But I know what you're thinking. You live in suburbia, you don't own 10 acres. Will it work on a smaller piece of property? That's a good question. Let's go to Margie and Dan Turfster's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They own 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than what Cindy and I have. Uh, and they're in the middle of suburbia. They're surrounded by the, the lots with the big lawns and the, the burning bush. Uh, the first thing they did was get rid of their major invasive species, which is bush honeysuckle. Uh, and they planted a bunch of native plants. And then they also put in a water feature they call a bubbler. And then they sat back on their 0.6 acres and started to count the number of bird species that used their yard. They are up to 149 bird species that have used their yard, including 35 warbler species. Now, just in comparison, we've only recorded eight warbler species at, at our house. So does it work on smaller, smaller lots? Yes, it does. What about in urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in, in uh, Chicago. And I do mean in Chicago. Right over this wall here is one of the runways of O'Hare Airport. Right over here is Kennedy Expressway. And Pam has one tenth of an acre that is three times smaller than the average lot size in uh, North America. And she, there's no connectivity with a natural area at all. So she's a tiny little island in a city, but she got rid of her invasive plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a water feature. And then she sat back and started to count her birds. And she's up to 117 species of birds that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, you can go to, go to Pam's house and check it out. What about city centers though? 82% of us live in cities. Well, in 2014, I was staring at this plant, Asclepias tuberosa. People call it butterfly weed, but that reminds me we have a serious marketing issue with our, our native plants. We call them weeds and wonder why people don't plant them. So we're not gonna call this butterfly weed. We're gonna call it Monarch's Delight. So I was, I was staring at Monarch's Delight and the first thing I saw were two species of leafcutter bees, megachylid bees. I know they are megachylid bees because they carry their, their pollen on their tummies. Um, well, megachylids have very specific requirements. Not only do they need pollen and nectar, but they also need soft leaves, leaves like uh, you find on red buds because they snip the edges of those leaves and form little, little semicircles. Um, and they roll up those circles and stuff them full of pollen, lay an egg on it, and then rear their young in it. And so these are, th oops, come back. Oh dear. These are three uh, leaf cutter bee packages, they stuffed them all in the same hole. This was taken by Heather, Heather Holmes. So that's what it looks like when it's stuffed with pollen and the babies are, are being reared inside. Well, uh, because there was a red bud growing right next to Monarch's Delight, the, the bees had everything they, they needed. And that's why they were there. It's probably why there were bumblebees there as well. Remember, bumblebees over winter is queens. So when they come out in the spring, it's just the queen. There are no workers. They have to start the colony themselves and they need abundant forage to do that. And that's exactly what red buds provide very early in the season. Then I saw a monarch, actually I saw two monarchs foraging on Monarch's Delight. Now this was June of 2014. I had gone all of 2013 without seeing a single monarch. That was the low point of the monarch population. It you know, really looked like we might, we might lose them. So here it was June, early in the season, I was seeing a monarch for the, for the first time. Um, I, was, I was excited. Why were they there? Well, they had, they had monarchs to light, but they also had another species of milkweed, uh, purple milkweed, uh, which of course, this is where they, they lay their eggs. This is where they breed. So it's not just about the flowers. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of middle of Manhattan. Uh, if you don't know about the High Line, is a uh, was an elevated railroad that had been abandoned for years. 
uh, and somebody went up and looked at it and there were a lot of native plants that had seeded in um, and, and were doing quite well with no help at all. So they decided to make it a tourist destination, sunk a lot of money into it. And it now is a major tourist destination. Millions of people go to the Highline every year. And this is the strip of nature that I'm talking about here. It's about a three foot strip that follows the, the High Line. You know, 30 feet above the taxis, right in the middle of Manhattan. This is Rick Dark. He uh, always wanted me to go to the High Line, see the beautiful plants. I'm not much of a city boy, so I dragged my feet. You know, I, I thought I'd go and I'd see beautiful plants, but there wouldn't be anything on them. And to me, that's, that's very sad. Um, well, I was, I was totally wrong. Somebody's done a study of, of the, the native bees at the Highline. They're up to 30 species that are using it now. And then all the things that, that I saw. So I was, I was convinced by that one little trip that if thoughtful native planties can bring life back to the middle of Manhattan, um, we can do this anywhere. Good news. But there are four things we need to think about uh, if we're going to succeed. And the first one is, is actually pretty obvious. We have to shrink the area that we have in lawn because we got too much lawn. We've got over 40 million acres of lawn nationwide, which is the size of New England. And the way we treat our lawn, it's a, it's a deadscape. That's a lot of area that we are killing. Uh, and remember, we need all those ecosystem services. So I know that lawn is a status symbol. I know that, that it is a message we are fitting in with our culture and that we're good citizens. So we can still do that. We're just gonna have less lawn. Let's cut the area of lawn in half. We'll manicure what's left. We can still send our, our positive signals to the neighbors, but we're gonna plant a lot of plants in the other half. And if we do that in half the area that's now in lawn, that'll give us 20 more million acres that we can put towards conservation. And if we do that at home, we can create what I've been calling homegrown national park, which will be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So we will have the biggest national park in the country. What are you going to get from that national park? Uh, a number of things. First of all, it will give us the opportunity to develop a personal relationship with the natural world right where we live, at our own time, at our own pace. You don't, you can avoid crash. You know, if you go to a real national park, uh, millions of people there. It's also free. There's no admission charge. It's never closed, no matter what pandemic comes down the road. No travel hassles. And you get to experience the natural world alone. This is vital if you're going to develop that personal relationship with, with nature. And it's particularly important for our kids. Remember, our kids are the future stewards of the planet. And if they don't know what they're stewarding or why they need to steward, they're going to be lousy stewards. Uh, and Richard Lube says they're, they're suffering from nature deficit disorder. So we've, we've got, to, got to expose them to nature. What are we doing now? Well, we put them on a bus, get 30 kids, put them on a bus with a teacher. They drive for an hour, go to a natural area. Teacher tells them not to touch anything and they walk around. They get back on the bus and come home. What they've really experienced there, I mean, it's probably better than nothing, but they've really experienced 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. We need to let them go outside alone no parental supervision, most of them will make it back alive and develop some kind of a relationship with what is in your, your yard. Maybe they will learn to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii uh, on a very small patch of nature and it's not all that natural. It's grass with a hedge, uh, but there are no lizards there. And um, this is how you hunt them. She explained it very carefully to me. You get on the ground and you disguise yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards don't see you coming. Then you crawl very slowly towards the lizard. No smiling. This is serious business here. Uh, you can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put them in an aquarium and you've got that personal relationship. Now, I don't think Zoe's gonna be catching lizards uh, on, her, on with their best dress on the ground for the rest of her life. Uh, but I guarantee she will remember catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. And she will be a better steward of the planet for that experience. If you want to, to expose your kids to more than lizards, get this book, Nature Play at Home by Nancy Stranisti. Excellent examples of how to expose your kids to the natural world right at home. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, uh, it's free. Um, 
you go to homegrownnationalpark.org and you put in your, your data. So it's where you live and the amount of area that you have converted to, to natural plantings. You're going to, you, you know, it's preserved in some other, some other way. The object is for, and then you will light up the map. And we want this to catch on virally so that uh, we can reach that 20 million acre goal. We can watch the map light up, tell your neighbors to do the same thing. Uh, and once we reach 20 million acres, we're not going to stop. We want to do the whole whole country. Um, it's supposed to, supposed to be fun. It seems to be working pretty pretty well. Okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. Um, what are we going to put in the area we take out of lawn? Well, what, one of the things we need to put there are what I call keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is. You got the Roman arch, and the stone in the middle is the keystone. If you take the stone out, the arch falls down. Well, keystone plants are so important in our food webs. If we take them out of our landscapes, the food web collapses. So what is a keystone plant? There's just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of that caterpillar food. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food. So if you try to build a landscape without that 14%, um, you have a failed food web. So the question no longer is, is simply, are natives better than, than non-natives? On average, they certainly are, but um, there are a lot of not natives who aren't all that productive. I can make a 100% native landscape that's supporting very little. Uh, so the question really is, do we want ecologically productive plants in our landscapes or ecologically destructive plants? Um, you know, if you, if you put that calorie pear in your yard, it's not gonna stay there. It will, but its babies won't. Uh, and, and that's called biological pollution. It's an inv really invasive plant. It's, those plants are ecologically castrating all the land around us. Um, so, so not a good choice when we're trying to support um, food webs around us. I get an email once or twice a year from somebody saying, don't I know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba actually grew in North America 7 million years ago. And that makes them native. And that means we can plant them and everything will be great. Well, yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today, but I'm not going to I'm not going to have that argument because that's no longer our metric. It's not whether it's native or not, it's whether it's productive or not. And I don't care if ginkgos grew on the moon 7 million years ago. Today, they support zero species of caterpillars. So they're there, they're occupying space, but they are not contributing to our local food web. What is contributing? Well, in 84% of the counties of the country, oaks are number one in terms of their contributions. In the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars, 557 species of bird food, 900 species nationwide. There is no other plant genus that comes close to that. Here is the, the role that keystone oaks play in, in our yard here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. And remember, I've photographed 1,031 species of moths so far. Out of that 1,031 species, 907 have known host plants. Out of the 907, 267 species use oaks. Now we have 69 genera of native plants, native woody plants on our property. And only one of them is the genus Quercus, the oaks. And we've got hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So oaks represent less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity, but they're supporting almost 30% of our moss species. And that's a huge part of our, uh, the energy that supports the rest of the diversity on our property. Imagine what would happen to the diversity on our property if we took oaks out of the system. That's the power of keystone oaks. How do you find out what the keystone species are for where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website and you put in your zip code and the ranked list of both woody and herbaceous plants for your county will pop up. Uh, so uh, for, for Atlanta, it'll look something like this. Um, native oaks, native cherries, native willows. Notice I say native here. Uh, you can go to the nursery and say, I wanna buy a cherry and almost certainly they will sell you a flowering cherry from, from China. I want to buy a willow. They'll sell you a weeping willow from, from Turkey. I want to buy a birch. They'll sell you a, a, a weeping birch from, from Europe or a maple, a Japanese maple from, from Japan. Specify that you want a native member of these genera. Even though these are native genera, if you plant a non-native member, you're going to reduce caterpillar use by 65%. These are the, the top genera. Now, you know, I stop here because I ran out of room. There's a lot more than this. Um, but goldenrods, the several genera of asters, um, 
are, are uh, native sunflowers, they're all native, but the uh, perennial ones in particular. These are the top three genera, not only in terms of making caterpillars, goldenrod supports 110 species of caterpillars, but also in terms of supporting our specialist bees. There are at least 40 species of, of bees that can only reproduce in the pollen of these plants. So if you don't have them, representatives of them in your yard, you've just lost 40 species, potential species of, of native bees that could be breeding there. All right, we're gonna shrink the lawn. We're gonna put in keystone plants. We're gonna attract lots of insects to our yard and then we're gonna kill them with our security light. And of course, that is not the goal. There is research from, from uh, particularly from Europe that is suggesting one of the major reasons for insect declines uh, in recent decades is light pollution. The way we light up the, the night at, uh, every single night. Um, lights at night kill insects in a lot of ways through exhaustion, collisions, incinerations, dehydration, increasing predation, bat predation, blinds them. A lot of our nocturnal insects are blinded by bright lights and it keeps them from doing what they ought to be doing. Uh, to me, this is really good news, believe it or not, because if we've identified a major reason for insect declines that is this easy to turn around, that's good news. All we have to do is turn the lights off, flick of a switch. Cannot think of anything that's easier. But I know what you're going to say. I can't turn my nightlight off because then the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on your nightlight. So it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to find out is the bad man doesn't come very often. But if you don't want to do that, take the white light out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED bulb is the best, uses the least amount of energy, and uh, uh, is the least attractive to night flying insects. We could save billions of insects overnight if we simply switched out our white lights for, for yellow LED lights. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn, we're going to put in keystone plants, we're going to turn our lights out, and then we're going to get Mosquito Joe to come and kill all our insects. There's no, we have no, no end to the way we like to kill our insects. Um, I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time in there. This is a major issue across the country now. Everybody's fogging for, for insects or for mosquitoes. Um, and Mosquito Joe will tell you two things. He said, this is a natural product, therefore it's okay. And now he's correct. It is a pyrethroid. It comes from plants. But let me remind you, cyanide is a natural product too. Um, so I'm not, not sure that it's okay. And he also say it will only kill mos adult mosquitoes. Not, not true at all. Kills all the insects that it uh, comes in contact with. The way you control, the big thing is it doesn't work. That's why he's got to come back and back and back. It only kills about 10% of the adult mosquitoes that are out there. You need to kill 90% to get control. The best way to control mosquitoes is with, in the larval stage. And this is worth trying. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put uh, straw or grass in there, let it um, ferment for a couple of days. Uh, that becomes an irresistible medium for uh, female mosquitoes to lay their eggs in. So after a couple of days, then throw in a mosquito dunk. You get it at the hardware store. It's Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a natural disease that attacks aquatic diptera. And the larvae will, will feed on it and it will, it will kill them. That is a totally directed control towards mosquitoes. If dragonflies in, get in there, it doesn't hurt them at all. If your dog licks it, it doesn't hurt it at all. Um, and if everybody did this, we'd get, we'd get good mosquito control. And it's much, much, much cheaper and it works. All right, fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them like the polyphemus moth complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from a branch. Then it emerges as an adult and it does the whole thing again. I wish everything uh, did that, but most of them don't. 480 species, but 94% drop from the tree and, and wiggle underneath the ground and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And the problem of course is there is no leaf litter under the tree and the ground is compacted and mowed and trampled and it's like a rock and our caterpillars can't get underground. So they drop out of the tree and they die. And the next generation is smaller and the next generation of that is completely gone. I am convinced that the way we typically landscape is one of the major reasons for, for insect declines. And of course the cement landscape is even uh, less of a viable option for caterpillars. I'm not trying to discourage the use of trees in, in cities. I'm trying to discourage the profligate use of cement as a default landscape. This is just laziness. 
um, and it destroys our watersheds. We know that. This is what most people do. They, they put a tree in the middle of the, the lawn and caterpillars drop out. Nobody has measured how well they do in a situation like this, but I guarantee they do better in a situation like this, where you've got a tree and then a layered landscape, uh, maybe a, a, a a canopy tree over, a, you know, a uh, dogwood over this, then a native azalean, ferns and ground covers. The caterpillars drop down into a safe site where they can easily get beneath the very loose soil to pupate, or they spin a cocoon in the in the uh, leaf litter. The no mowing, nobody's going to step on them or squish them. Uh, completely safe site. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening, uh, and this is how you shrink the lawn. Put a big bed around your around your trees. Uh, you can easily connect all the trees in your yard with beds and just have swaths of grass in between them. They're all safe sites. This is where you can use your, your uh, ground covers, your wild ginger, your may apple, your foam flower, and, and uh, your ferns. Look at this is, actually, I believe this is in Athens, Georgia. Um, but, you know, middle of a city, middle of a hotel, and you, you, uh, you have good safe site for your caterpillars coming out of these trees. Another grad student, Desiree Narango, has done good work with, with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, DC. And from her work, we have concluded there is room for compromise in our plant choice. This is good news. She looked at how well we can sustain chickadee populations in landscapes, just suburban yards that are largely native or are dominated by introduced plants. And when they're dominated by introduced plants, they produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So you reduce the amount of food for the chickadees by 75% right away. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Even though there's a nest box up, she put a nest box in all these, these yards. Chickadees came, they looked around and said, there's not enough to eat here. We're not even gonna try to breed. If they did try to breed, the nest contains 1.5 fewer eggs. They were 29% less likely to survive. Uh, those nests produce 1.2 fewer fledglings if they did survive and they matured at a slower rate, 1.5 days longer. You might say, well, those aren't huge differences, but if you put all that together into a population growth model, as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plants uh, in your biomass, in your, in your yard, from nothing to 100%, this is what you get. This dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. If you reproduce at this rate, that's a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you have a growing population. But if you make fewer, you have a shrinking population. And right here is where those lines overlap, around 30% non-native plants. So you can have a growing or sustainable population when you have 30% or, or less of your Non, of your of your um, plant biomass non-native. And if you have 70% uh, or more of your plant biomass native, but if you get more than 30% non-native plants, then you're down in the, the unsustainable part of the, of the graph. The chickadees um, fail to make enough babies to replace the adults every year. Uh, what uh, um, So this is, this is great news for two reasons. First of all, it's the first time it's been measured for any bird anywhere. So anybody who doubts that your plant choice actually impacts the birds around you, um, this ought to convince you that it does. But it also tells us about this zone of compromise here. You can have your camellias, you can have your boxwood, you can have your, your crepe myrtle. None of those are invasive plants um, as long as they don't dominate the landscape. You can have them without destroying chickadee or other bird re reproduction. Uh, so that, you know, compromise is, is a good thing. Uh, if I said, if my message was still, you can't have any non-native plants, I'd have very few people listening to me. It's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of productive native plants. So even though you got some of these, add those native plants, it'll be all right. Can we use uh, native plants in formal landscapes? Of course we can. I got this picture from North Carolina. Um, they're developing this garden, putting in, replacing the non-natives with native plants. Here's Joe Pye. Notice I didn't say Joe Pye weed. It's not a weed. Uh, and they're going to replace all of them and then send me, send me another picture. It is, remember, formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the landscapes in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in, in Europe all the time. And I guess it's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a, a pollinator garden into a traditional suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can. Let's put a little fence around it. 
it's beautiful. It's, you know, it's, it's formalized. So everybody knows this is intentional. It's helping several species of native bees. Uh, there's the evening primrose, by the way. Um, it's not very big, but you know, if everybody did it, it would service still a, a lot of, of bees. I don't like the way we, we promote pollinators. We could say, well, we need them for, for our agriculture, about 30% of our agriculture. It's actually about 12% of our agriculture. But then people think, well, if I don't live next to an agricultural field, I don't need any pollinators. Not true. We need pollinators because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Not an option. Where do you need those pollinators? Everywhere including where we live. How about this? This is a Drew Latham design. It's much bigger than our, our little fence. Um, imagine the amount of life that is here versus the amount of life that is here. No brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? They can and they are doing that. Um, Minnesota has a cost sharing program where it's uh, helping homeowners pay to convert some or all of their lawn to appropriate Minnesota prairie plantings. Very successful program. Florida, uh, there's an island off Florida that is paying residents to allow burrowing owls, listed species to burrow in their front yards. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. If you have an endangered species on your property, you get paid to take care of it as opposed to, to find in case you walk around. Missouri uh, and, and Fayetteville, Arkansas have a, a, a bounty on calorie pairs. You take out a calorie pair, you get a free tree replacement. And even utilities are getting into the act. The, uh, there's a public utility in San Antonio, give people $100 coupons to replace uh, water thirsty plants with uh, efficient water efficient native plants. Buffalo's giving people $100 coupons to put in natives. And I just learned of another one the other day that I can't remember, but people are doing it all over the place. Oops. And of course there's the big lawn replacement uh, programs in the far West uh, in uh, particularly California, up to $2 per square foot rebate. If you take out your, your thirsty grass and put in Xeric plantings. I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And the first is, is that, you know, we like nature, we've assumed it's important, but not essential. There's the misstep right there. So if it's not essential, whenever, whenever resources are short, which is always, it takes a back seat. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out and there was this wall sized poster there. It says, I'm gonna save wildlife for future generations. Uh, and you know, this is the, this is the mindset of um, major conservationists. This was, this was uh, Teddy Roosevelt's reasoning for why we should create the national parks so that future generations could enjoy nature. And that's very, very true, but it's more urgent than that. Nature's not there just for our entertainment. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. A little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. But when we do that, we're restricting conservation efforts to just tiny little areas where we don't have a lot of humans. Excuse me. And that means we've condemned them to failure. Because again, those areas are too small, too isolated from each other to sustain the species that we need. David Quammen has this um, excellent analogy between a, a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That's a Persian rug, functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And this is what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that language because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards. So let's glue our rug back together again. Let's fill in these white spaces by putting in the plants that support the food webs that our animals need. We're not just going to build biological carters so they can move back and forth between viable habitat. We're going to create viable habitat right now where there is none. And we're going to do it with those power hat plants. And we're going to do it right where we live, where we work, where we play. We're going to start to share our human spaces with nature. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few ecologists, a few conservation biologists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every human being in the planet. But I don't know why, because every human being on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't all of us, every single one of us, bear the responsibility of good Earth stewardship? 
Stan Ren Rushworth once said, he was a Cherokee elder, that the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with these mindsets, you're taught them. We are great at teaching this one. We are terrible at teaching this one. Our kids grow up not recognizing that they have an obligation to good earth stewardship. It doesn't mean they have to save biodiversity for a living, although it's a good living, but we all really can save it where we live. And I, and I, I love this approach because it empowers each one of us. Right now, you know, there are big problems out there and most of us feel powerless about addressing any one of them. But this is one where, uh, you know, the cliche is correct. A single individual can make a difference. Go out and plant that oak tree, shrink your lawn, put in a pollinator garden, get rid of your invasive ornamental plants. You will create a viable ecosystem right where you live and you'll get to see it happen and you're one person. And if everybody does that, we're gonna succeed. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problem. You'll, you'll get depressed. Just worry about your little piece of the earth that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you focus. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help, help your local park or preserve. They're all short uh, of, of staff and short funded. They'll love you. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power. We certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and ultimately our own fate. I convinced my granddaughters, grandchildren, I guess I've got kids too. Convince my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Dr. Tallamy, thank you so much. What an amazing talk as always. I learned even more than I thought I was going to. Um, I know everyone with us, um, all 600 folks with us tonight, thank you as well. I know it won't come as any surprise to you, but we have lots and lots of questions and you've kindly agreed to try to answer most of them. All right. So uh, do you need a cup glass of water before we dive on it? I, I got it right here. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> okay, um, one of the first questions I have is, do you have any new suggestions for deterring deer since they are a major threat to native plants in my garden? I have new suggestions. Um, no, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but you know, one, there is, a, there is a new natural partial control for deer and that is coyotes. Um, they can take fawns the first couple of days of their life. Uh, so one thing we could do is to stop our war against coyotes. You know, I saw a great statistic just, just yesterday that more people are killed by um, errant golf balls or champagne corks than are, than are bitten by coyotes in, in a, a single year. So, you know, we, we know they're a terrible threat. They're not a terrible threat to, to us, um, but they do help a little bit with the deer, um, you know. Not a lot. We've got way too many deer. We know how to control our deer. We just choose not to. So um, it's 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 a social uh, phenomenon. It's I call it the Bambi effect. It's it's emotional, and I understand it because the Bambi effect is happening right at our house too. So um, so I do understand it. But there are serious costs to not controlling our deer. Thank you. Okay, another gardener shares that he does not cut any of his perennials back in the fall. They remain as they are all winter, but in the spring, he cuts them back to encourage new growth, removing old. So his question is, is when he cuts back perennials in the spring, should he cut them back to just above the ground or slightly higher, leaving dead stems for various bees to overwinter in the upcoming fall? Yes. <laughs> Heather Holm has done some nice research and has found that um, most of the overwintering uh, and the, 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 the summer use of those stems uh, happens in maybe the top 12 inch or the bottom 12 inches of the plant. So if you leave about a foot uh, and you, know, you, you can do that, it, it, it's much neater than you would think. That gives them really the resource that they, that they need. 
Uh, it's good to wait till the spring to cut down that top part of the plant because the top part has seeds on it. That's what our, you know, many of our overwintering birds depend on. Things like sparrows uh, and, and juncos, don't, they don't go to feeders. They're doing the seeds on the ground. So if you cut it back in the fall, you've wiped out all that resource for the, for the birds. But cutting it back high is a, a great, um, great solution. Thanks. Okay, another question. Um, a gardener, she's wondering about the efficacy and benefits of trying to plant a landscape that promotes plant and animal diversity within a suburb where all the next door neighbors are typically using loads of chemicals and planting with no concern um, for diversity. In other words, her question is simple. Does it actually help much to be the lone wolf in my big old neighborhood? If you were the lone wolf on the planet, no, it wouldn't wouldn't help much. But you know, some of your neighbors are changing. Look at you are going to do it now. Would you've done it 10 years ago? I don't know. A lot of people are doing it now who who um, never even thought about it in the past. So the goal is that your neighbor is going to change too. And you can set an example. So one of the things you can do is to create a beautiful yard. You know what, there's so many people write to me, particularly um, older women who say, I'm the butterfly lady in the, in the whole neighborhood and all the kids come to my house to see the butterflies and they, they love that. Um, you know, it, it's a good example, a role model that there's an alternative to the dead landscape. There's more and more information out there about the hazards of, of the, um, the herbicides that we put on our lawns. You know, what Scott's tells turf builder says take your shoes off after you apply the fertilizer in the fall and the spring if you read how long you're supposed to take your shoes off when you walk inside it's for the rest of the season which means your lawn is toxic the whole time so when your kids and your cat are rolling around on it you know it's just not a good idea the the fogging uh, you know well we're hoping to turn your neighbors around so yes you get going and and set a good example and maybe they'll turn around faster so another audience member is asking, um, they have loads of invasives, invasives on their property, including kudzu, Japanese knotweed, and of course, stilt grass, which I think every single person in Georgia battles constantly. And they just want your advice on how to get rid of invasives without poison. You know, if you add porcelain berry to that, you got the top four. I know, That'd right? <laughs> awful. Um, you cannot remove invasives without killing the roots. So how do you kill roots without, without poisons? There are a few ways, uh, but it's a lot more difficult. It, so it depends on the size of, of the area that you're dealing with. Woody plants, you know, if you cut them off at the base, um, the object is to, re, is to exhaust the root system, all the energy that they have. So repeated cuttings uh, can do that. But by repeated, I mean, every two weeks or something, as soon as they shut up, shot up some, shoot up some green, uh, you don't want them to photosynthesize again. That will work over time, but it's a lot of work. Um, I actually compromise. Um, I, don't, I don't spray because I always hit non-targets and for all the reasons that we don't spray, but I do paint. So I cut off that, that trunk of the autumn olive and I paint the, the stump. It's very little material and it does kill the roots. So I don't have to do it a thousand times. I'm, I'm too old. I'm not gonna live long enough to kill that guy. And that's just one plant. Um, you know, kudzu, what an enormous problem. I mean, holy moly, how do you kill a kudzu root without herbicide? I just don't know. I don't know. So we've created enormous problems by bringing these plants in here. Uh, and there are, there are issues with herbicides, no doubt but most of them come from the misuse and overuse of them. I think of herbicides the way I think of, of chemotherapy. Mm. You know, chemotherapy is poison, but it's killing the cancer for us. We cannot take it and die, or we can take it and hope, hope that we live. So I don't know if it's a good analogy or not, but I, I do not know how you would kill kudzu without herbicide. I just don't. I don't think anyone's figured that out yet. <laughs> Another question, a couple has um, a property with a west facing slope bordering a heavily wooded area and they're looking for recommendations for a slow spreading, low growing native ground cover that will provide soil stabilization. There's actually a, a bunch of them. You know what? I'm going to I'm going to promote a book here. Promote a book. Yay. Promote a book. 
Essential Native Trees and Shrubs of the East. So this goes from the north right down to the south by Tony Dove and Ginger Wool Ridge. Uh, in the first substantial part of this book are extensive charts telling you what each plant does and what it's good for. And that includes soil stabilization. Um, I'm thinking of one right now and I'm blanking out because, because now I'm spaced out. Um, Roos aromatica, low growing Roos aromatica will grow over your, your, uh, your slope very well. All of our sumacs will. And I'm not talking about poison sumac, I'm talking about smooth sumac or, or uh, staghorn sumac, great soil stabilizers. Um, there are a lot of, you know, Virginia creeper, nobody likes Virginia creeper, it's a great soil st stabilizer. Um, so there are really a lot of, a lot of options. Um, and, and regular, if that were a, a forested hillside in the Smokies, I mean, it would be trees. It would be, it would be young um, canopy trees that are spreading their roots out and holding that, that soil. So all of those plants are good options. Okay, another question, and I think what you just answered can help this individual as well. Um, she's asking what specific types of native plants do you recommend for shade of Mount Desert Island? So I guess we have someone joining us from Maine this evening. Okay, you know, you have to pay attention to, to soil type. So um, I think you better look for something that's salt tolerant up there. Uh, black cherry is actually a, a, a great salt tolerant plant. Um, and so is beach plum, uh, that grows right on the beach. And that's another, another prunus. Um, shade, you know, a lot of plants will do well in the shade. They just won't bloom well in the shade. So if you're simply trying to get plants as understory, um, and, you know, you're not going to get great blooms, but uh, I don't know if hydrangea arborescens gets up that far north or not, but the straight species um, not Annabelle, the straight species is a, is a great bloomer in the shade. It blooms better in the shade than any other shrub that I know of. Um, so if it goes that far north, that would be, that would be a good one. Um, witch hazel is, is another great understory plant. It's always in the shade uh, it does well, so. Okay, another question. Um, this gardener, his neighborhood is filled with giant old pine trees and he thinks they're an incredible habitat, of course. Um, the problem is, is that most of them are completely covered in English ivy. Most mm. of his neighbors are older and cannot manually remove the ivy. And even if they are able, of course, it's a daunting task. So aside from, ooh, this is hard to read. Aside from cutting all the trees down and replanting them with more neighborhood friendly trees, what are my options? There are at least several hundred pines covered in English ivy in our neighborhood. Well, it's not the pines that are causing your problem. It's the English ivy. So cutting the pines down, down won't kill the English ivy and they'll just smother whatever you replace there. So you have to target the English ivy. Um, you can, you know, it's climbing your trees, but with thick stems at the base. So you can go around and cut those stems and that'll, that'll kill the ivy that's on the trees themselves. Um, you're going to have to get the root in the ground at some point. I think you need to hire somebody personally <laughs> to do that. It is a big job. This is why the state of Oregon has finally banned the sale of English ivy because the entire state is covered in it. Um, another big, another big problem. I, you know, don't big go problem buy English Georgia. ivy. I mean, <laughs> but you, it, it is, it is, it is tractable. It's not as bad as kudzu. Um, you can, you can kill it again. Uh, how you would do it without herbicide, I don't know. Okay, another question. Um, it is becoming more and more common in Atlanta for residents to pay lawn crews to cover the non-turf, more natural areas of their yards with three to four inches of pine stock. Yeah, I see this all the time. Would you speak to the impact of this? So they're putting pine straw down as mulch everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> You know, in a pine forest, that is the mulch that's that's there. And bare soil is there's nothing good about it. So pine mulch over bare soil is is much better. It maintains soil moisture and um, somewhat of a healthy um, community. I don't know that Atlanta was a pine forest. You're not in the coastal plain, are you? You're in the Piedmont. I yeah, believe. we're in the Piedmont. We yeah, were we were a blend. Blended. Yeah, right on the edge. Yeah. 
Um, so some pines are okay. Monoculture, you can do much better by getting some of the oaks and the other things in there, in which case you'd, you would have not just the, the, you know, the pine litter, you'd have regular leaves. Um, but, you know, the natural leaf fall, I think of leaf fall, whether it's pine needles or leaves, the way we used to think about water, where all the water that falls in your property has to stay in your property. All the leaves that fall on your property have to stay on your property because that's the turnover of nutrients that's going to give your trees what they actually need. So keeping that stuff in your properties is good, um, but a you know a, a monoculture where you shouldn't have one is probably not as good. Okay, um, hello from Illinois. Um, another guest. Yeah. I am hosting a book club for a group of friends interested in making a difference in a wide range of current issues, including topics of justice, inequality, and environmental issues. I'm trying to choose between nature's best hope and bringing nature home. Both are absolutely incredible and have changed my life and how I view my garden, but which would you recommend to people who may not be as knowledgeable or passionate about this topic? I would love your personal pick. I would recommend nature's best hope because it's, it's much more current. I mean, I wrote Bringing Nature Home in 2005, and uh, it was before we've done a lot of the research that has uh, borne out the predictions we made in, in Nature's Best Hope. So it's more, I think it's a more convincing, more compelling story. Um, and that's what I would recommend. Okay. Um, another question? We have so many questions. Um, let's see. This one is very interesting. I had ordered goldenrod plants, but when they came to me, the order included a notice that the plants had been treated with a pesticide to combat fire ants. Will this be bad for the pollinators when the flowers bloom if I plant them? Well, I'd love to know what it was. I mean, you don't want to be spreading fire ants around. So um, that's, that's good. Anything it was treated with will not last forever. Your, your goldenrod is a perennial, it'll come up year after year. So uh, it's not like one treatment is gonna make that a poison plant for the next 15 years. Uh, and if, you're, if you've got plugs, my guess is that they will have grown out of, of much of the, uh, the toxin before it, it blooms. Um, that, what would what would they control fire ants with? It's not going to be an it's not going to be a systemic in the plant. It's probably just something in the in the root system. So my guess is it'd be okay, but it is a guess. Um, another question: Say I live in a townhouse in a dense city environment. I have some room for flowers, but not many opportunities for trees and bushes. What are some options to help wildlife thrive there? Well, your townhouse has a, a landscape, and it's probably and it, the owner landscapes it some way. Um, maybe you could influence how that is done. Maybe you get permission to, even though you don't own it, you you know, is there is there a yard big enough where you could actually plant a tree and say, "I'm going to take care of this. This will be my tree." And just get permission to do it. That would be one thing I suggest. If there's if you have no ground. Um, you do have limited options, but uh, container gardening is probably the only thing that, that you could do. And I have seen Joe Pye uh, in, in containers with loaded with butterflies. I have seen um, milkweeds in, in containers. Uh, you know, get, get a big container, but you get a nice patch going there and it's not a lot, but it can service uh, at least monarchs or, or uh, some of the more mobile butterflies. So the next question is, have you given your presentation to Congress? If not, you should. <laughs> you know, some people go to Congress without being invited. I'm not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I think you need, to know, you need to be invited. If I am invited, I'll be there, believe you me. But no, they're, they're, not, they're not on it yet. Um, another question. Will you please identify the yellow-headed, black-throated bird on your opening slide? I'm in love. <laughs> that is the hermit warbler, and it's a West Coast bird. I took that when visiting our grandchildren who live in Portland, Oregon. Um, it was at the top of a mountain, and I lugged the camera all the way up there, and it, all the way up, I'm saying, this is stupid. It's not going to be there. It's not going to be there, but I got there, and it was there, so, so it worked. But um, it's one of the warblers. I mean, we've got very beautiful warblers here in the East. As a matter of fact, the, the, the people in the West, they love our Eastern warblers. So it's just, you know, you always love what you don't have. 
Another question, this is a good question. What are no to low cost ways people living on uh, limited or low incomes can participate in this work? My goodness, seeds are free. Remember when I said I planted my oaks from acorns? I'm not kidding. You walk down the street, you find the acorns on the ground and plant them. The big trick there is, is um, you, you got to make sure they're not eaten. So uh, if you plant a white oak acorn, for example, in the fall, uh, chances are a, a, a mouse is going to eat it before before the spring comes along. So I, I actually put them in pots now so that um, I can I can protect them a little bit more over the winter. The red oak acorns, um, they're not as, as uh, they're a little bit more bitter and not as many things eat them. So I I remember going, I was giving blood once and there was a tree in the parking lot that there were just thousands of acorns on the ground and I scooped up a bunch, put them in the car and I got home and I just threw them. A lot of them germinated. That was pretty easy, and it was totally free. So that's just one example. But you can you can um, you can germinate a lot of different plants absolutely free. Or the the other big thing is to get your plants young, get them small where they don't cost a lot. People think if you plant a tree, you've got to get a, a ten foot tree that's going to cost you three thousand dollars. No, 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 no. And that's that's. It's a tough way to plant it too because they've all been root pruned and they've got a 50% chance of, of dying. So go as small as you can. It will be a whole lot cheaper. Okay, next question. This is a good question. I'd love to know this answer. What do you think about feeding birds? Does it interrupt the natural cycle? Uh, it depends on when you're talking about. Feeding birds in the winter time, there's a lot of evidence that it is a good thing. Uh, remember, the birds that overwinter, the ones that don't migrate, they have to live off the land during the winter. And, um, you know, you've got a nicer winters down there in Georgia than we have, but it's a long, cold time where they have to live off the seeds of the land. And if you look at what we've done to the land, a lawn or some of the, there's no seeds there. So the birds that are, are, are trying to make it through the winter, uh, many of them depend on our, our bird feeders, particularly when it's very very cold. So putting out the um, the suet, putting out the sunflower seeds uh, is a matter of life and death for an awful lot of our, our birds. They also enter the breeding season in the spring heavier so they can lay more eggs. Um, you want to do it responsibly. So you want to make sure that your, your feeders are clean and not, not going to spread disease. And you don't want to concentrate too many together because then all the birds are interacting and they can spread diseases to, with each other. But um, Bird feeding in the wintertime is good. In the summertime, it's much harder because um, the seed gets rancid. It, in the warm weather, it, it decays much, much faster. So it gets rancid faster. It's, it's tougher to use the, um, excuse me, the suet. And during the summertime, uh, the idea is that, you know, they're gonna switch to insects. They've got to do that for their, for their young. And this is why planting your, those native plants in your yard, you're actually planting bird feeders. So I stopped feeding the birds around the end of April. And um, then I start again, I start again, probably the end of October. Thank you. Another question. Do birds eat monarch caterpillars? I thought the milkweed made them poisonous. They make them distasteful. Yeah. And there's great pictures of blue jays throwing up after they eat monarch caterpillars. Um, this is not a yes or no question because there are a couple birds, some of the gross beaks actually have learned how to uh, eat monarch adults where they, uh, there's two ways they can do it. They can only eat the thorax, which has less cardenolides in it, um, or they can slice open the, the uh, abdomen and pull out the toxic innards and then eat, eat the rest of it. Um, so there are a couple, couple birds that have actually specialized. They'll go down, they'll monarch, migrate down to the monarch roost and eat them all winter long. But they're exceptions. Most birds avoid monarchs and the monarch caterpillars. There are a number of insect predators that eat monarch caterpillars, though. So next question. Um, you've spoken a lot about native caterpillars, but what about invasive or agriculturally destructive species? Can we find ways to manage them in a way that doesn't disrupt our needed larvae? It, is it as simple as planting native and bioregional species plants? Well, 
Um, well, yes, I say we need caterpillars and I am talking about native caterpillars. A non-native insect is, you know, as bad or worse than a non-native plant because they're here without their natural enemies. Think of the gypsy moth, think of the Japanese beetle, think of the hemlock woolly adelgid, the emerald ash borer, all the things that are clobbering our native, um, native plants. Uh, and and non-native diseases. Look what the chestnut blight did to our, our American forest. So um, I am not encouraging anything that's that's uh, non-native or, or invasive. How do we control them? It's you know, it's the same kind of problem we have with our, our non-native plants. Uh, the biocontrol, biological control. You bring in an agent that's specified that's specific on on that particular species is the best option. Uh, and sometimes it works wonderfully. It's, it's difficult to do. It takes at least 10 years of, of um, host specificity tests to find something that, that works. Uh, and, you know, so for example, the gypsy must have been here over a hundred years and we still haven't found a great biocontrol for it. A fungus found it came over here without our help all on its own. And that does a better job at controlling the gypsy moth than, than uh, anything that we've, we've tried. Um, so other than that, I don't know what you can do. But don't hesitate to kill a non-native insect. None of them are good. That's good to know. Uh, next question, are all oaks good for insects? Okay. Um, I will generalize and say yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, all native oaks, um, there's a loss when you use the uh, Quercus Sagittarius, that's uh, the Chinese oak and English oak. There's, there's a, a, a de decline in the insects that can use those. But um, do all oaks support insects equally is, is probably what you're asking. And the answer is we don't know. Although I do have a student right now who's comparing 16 species of oaks. Live oaks is not one of them because we don't have them up here. Um, I think the white oak group is gonna have a slightly more uh, support slightly more species than the red oak group, but not much, not much. So at this point, I would, I would say find an oak that is most appropriate for where you live you know, Quercus schumardia, the schumard oak, a great one for where you are uh, and and plant that. And don't worry about it because it'll be good. Um, next question, this is a big one. Can you suggest top five, 10 plants, genre of trees, shrubs, perennials, that one, grow greatest number of caterpillars for bird nestlings to eat and two, offer the most pollen and nectar for greatest number of pollinators? My yard is less than one acre. I want each plant I install to offer the biggest bang for the plant. Okay, good question. Um, <clears throat> that's what that native plant finder is, is for. It ranks them, it will give you the ones that support the most, most caterpillars. If you're looking for plants that do both, so for example, oaks support the most, but they don't support pollinators, they're wind pollinated. Um, goldenrod in terms of uh, herbaceous plants is probably uh, number one because it does support over a hundred species of caterpillars and is ex excellent for the, the pollinators. So are asters, so are those, those sunflowers. That's why I, I specified those. Um, black cherries are, are really good. Native prunus because an American plum because they're great for pollinators and they're also great for, for uh, caterpillars. Um, and you start going down the list. Uh, willows are, are super for both because and now I know the farther south you go, the more we, we start to lose our willows, but they bloom very early. So they're really great for early season pollinators and they're either number two or number three for, for caterpillars. So those would be ones I'd, I'd list right off, but, but go to the, the native plant finder because they're, they're ranked there. You can, you can see the numbers and say which one's going to help you the most. And we've just shared the link to that website um, for everyone to see. Um, what is the best oak for small, a very small yard in North Georgia? In where? In North Georgia. North Georgia. We're in North Georgia, technically. So. Yes. Um, you know, I have a list there's a, that is two pages long of oaks that are either small trees, shrubs, or even ground covers. Who knew? Everybody thinks all the oaks are gigantic, but... They're not. Uh, there are fewer small ones in the east than in the west, a number of small ones in the west, but uh, dwarf chinkapin oak uh, is, is one that would, would 
would work. Dwarf chestnut oak is another one that worked. They'll make acorns when they're five feet tall. Uh, and it, you know, it'll take 40 years for them to get to be 10 feet tall. So um, those are those are good small oaks for uh, North Georgia. Um, a big question that we all have struggle with. Do your neighbors spray for mosquitoes? If so, what do you say to them? Yeah, well, mine no. Um, <laughs> so I don't have, I don't have to deal with that. That is a, that is a, it's a big problem uh, because their spray, their fog doesn't stay on their property. So, um, you know, if it were another issue, if you had a, if they had a branch or if you had a branch leaning over in their property, they would either, you know, cut it off or sue you and nobody would question them. Oh, that's their right to do that. Well, do they have the right to kill everything on your property? Uh, I'm sure that a judge would say, no, they don't. But the, the problem would be proving that they did, you know, proving that their spray actually came onto your property. And this is probably why it hasn't become a litigious uh, uh, problem. But the best solution, of course, is to, to have a good relationship with your neighbor and explain what you're trying to do and explain wh why what they're doing is, is hurting you. Um, I'm sure that's not their intent. Uh, they probably think they're being good stewards and you're not because you're not killing everything. And that's the way the, most people have been raised. So it's education, but uh, it, it is a challenge of you living close together with people, very different mindsets. I mean, this is give them nature's best hope. That's why I wrote that book so they could see, oh, maybe this is not the best way to go. Uh, that maybe sneak it in their mailbox. I don't know. But. I love that idea. Um, this um, attendee asked, have, she has several oaks and hickories that came in on their own several years ago when pine beetle decimated pine population on about one third of our one acre lot. But I haven't seen these caterpillars. Uh, suggestions for spotting the caterpillars? Yeah, um, I hear that all the time. You have to become a good caterpillar hunter. Caterpillars don't want to be seen. Remember, the birds are looking for them day in, well, not at night. They can't look at them at night. But So that's actually a key. Uh, the best way to find caterpillars is to go out at night with a flashlight because a lot of caterpillars uh, are, are hiding during the day. Some of them actually crawl off the tree and then they crawl back on at night or they hide on a branch, but they're not on the leaves. Um, so night caterpillar hunting is much more productive than during the day. When you're hunting during the day, you definitely want to look in the underside of the leaf, not on the top, because that's they're more visible there. Um, a lot of them are cryptic. They're looking like leaf damage or like fungus. They're blending in with their background really, really well. Uh, and you have to get, we call it a search image where you, you can know what you're looking for, know where they might be hiding and look very carefully for them. I showed you lots of pictures of caterpillars, but I didn't see all them on the same day. Those are, you usually find the best caterpillars when you're not looking for them. You just stumble on them and then be ready with your, your camera. Uh, I also remember if I planted my oaks from acorns, they were within reach for a long time. I had, you know, 15 years of where I could easily reach the branches. Many of them I still can, so I can see them, uh, you know, I can hunt the, the leaves very easily. If you have a 200-year-old oak and the, the leaves are 50 feet up, that's much, much harder, so. Okay, I'm gonna do three more questions because it's now 8.40 and we still have 47 questions. Oh, and dear. that's just 47 <laughs> too many. I'm so sorry, everyone. I know everyone wants Dr. Talamy's knowledge. Um, but you can buy his books after That's all. True. So That's that, true. That will help. <laughs> okay. So she asked, um, there's much discussion in the pollinator and native plant discussion groups about the use of commercial cultivars of native pollinator plants. What do we know about the ecological difference between planting the straight native species of a pollinator plant and planting a commercial cultivar? Take Rebecca, for example, and how different is planting a straight native species from local seed source and the same native species from seed source outside of the area? Great question. Okay, well cultivars are different from a seed source outside of your area because you can have straight species that have different provenance. Um, and then the, the question is, will that seed do very well where you are? Uh, but in terms of the pollinators, uh, you know, straight species are gonna be good for the pollinators no matter where you get the seed from. 
uh, cultivars, uh, you know, genetic, genetically uh, altered um, plants, they're altered from the genotype of the, the straight species. I, I would invite Annie White from the University of Vermont down to talk to you. That's what she did her PhD on and she's got the data to show you. Um, we did a study with cultivars, but it wasn't on, it wasn't on flowers. It had nothing to do with pollinators. It was, it was looking at, at what happens when you tra change traits of the plant itself. Like if you, make a, if you make a green leaf red or purple, that was the only trait that actually discouraged insect use. Annie has found that when you change flowers, the, the um, likelihood that you are messing up the uh, specialized interaction between specialist pollinators and the flower is much higher. You know, if you make an echinacea look like a zinnia uh, so that it can sell well that, that year, um, it, it very often has less pollen. A lot, double flowers always have less pollen and less nectar like none. Uh, because the reproductive parts are now now bracts. Uh, so changing flower structure um, disrupts pollinators more often than not, but not always. There are exceptions. The the uh, Phlox paniculata um, uh, jenna, I think it is, actually has twice the number of flowers on it than the straight species, and it it's you know, services more butterflies. So, so it's not a, you know, a black and white question. The answer really is it depends. But um, I would love to see nurseries sell the straight species along with the cultivar so that you have the option. You can decide yourself what, what you're, you want to buy. Right now, most of the time, it's just the cultivar. So, so two more. Um, I have both red buds and a little monarch delight, but not near each other. One's in the front yard and one's in the backyard. Do no I need problem. To, no problem. Do I need to move the milkweed nearer to the red bud? No, no, no. The, the first of all, the the leafcutter bees don't need milkweeds. They were they were just getting nectar from them. They'll go to any of them. The uh, and they fly. <laughs> you know, they can find your if they'll find that red bud. Um, if it's within, I don't know, 50, at least 50 yards of, of where they're, they're nesting. And our final question, sorry, everyone, we have so many good questions. Um, this um, attendee wants to know what type of camera and lens and background do you use to capture your insects? <clears throat> it's a Nikon, um, but all the cameras are good. You know, the Canon people love their Canons. Um, Fuji people love their Fujis. Uh, you, you, when you start with a camera and you buy the lenses, you're kind of locked into it forever because those lenses are transferable. So there's nothing really special about Nikon. I've got a, a, a couple of um, telephoto lenses for the birds where you can be far away. And then a macro lens, a, a 105 millimeter macro lens uh, with macro flashes for the, the caterpillars. <coughs> I do paint a, a, a green background um, that you know is always out of focus <coughs> for the for the caterpillars for the birds. You just you have a, a narrow focal length and then it blurs the background. There's a quick lesson in photography. <laughs> thank you. Well, um, Dr. Talamy, thank you so much for being with us tonight. It was great fun. I wish we could stay on and ask all these questions because I want to know all the answers as well. Um, we really, really appreciate it. Thank you, because I know you're giving a talk a day on average, so you must be exhausted. So thank you for it's giving time your for knowledge. bed. You're right. You know, <laughs> your knowledge and energy to us tonight. Um, I want to let everyone know if you live nearby the Atlanta History Center, we do have copies of Nature's Best Pets right at our bookshop, and you can come here and purchase it. Um, you can also get it through Timber Press. I encourage you to order it through lo local bookstores as well. And um, you can also come to the Cherokee Garden Library, um, currently right now by appointment, and look at all of Dr. Talamy's books. We will be having more talks this spring and summer, so keep an eye out on social media and in your email boxes. And the Atlanta History Center has free virtual talks every week and all the time on myriad topics. We're so glad you were here tonight. Thank you for staying with us. And Dr. Talamy, thank you again for being here. To You're welcome. Good night, everybody. Okay. Good night.